Great. Hi, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity. So I'm going to be talking about gasinomics, which is basically the economics of the informal economy. And the reason I called it gasinomics was that the problem with the word informal economy is that it implies small-scale, unstructured, unsophisticated, low-profit, low-tech, all these things that come with the word informal. And the reality about that informal economy is that none of it is actually... Uh, true to those things. So I wanted to call it uh, gasinomics from the cool word for the gassy um, and uh, to kind of change the dynamic about that. Um, but wh why am I talking to you about gasinomics? So I grew up in a mud hut in a Zulu village in a place called Msinga in KwaZulu Natal. My parents were community workers and political activists. Uh, and they brought us up in a mud hut. We washed in the Tugela River. We, um, our kitchen was a gas stove under an acacia tree. Uh, my mother taught us at home under another acacia tree. Um, and we grew up like young Zulu boys. In fact, my main skills, I never went to university, was kind of stick fighting and goat herding, uh, which has been quite useful, as you shall see. <laughs> um, a lot of people say to me, but where's um, Singa? And I used to struggle to say where Singa is. But now I just say it's right next to Nkandla. So it <laughs> gives you an idea of where Singa is. Anyway, we grew up like that. My mother's 82. She still lives like that, refuses to change her life, still washes or together, and, um, and, uh, and still lives there running a, a community project there. Uh, anyway, I... Um, Eventually, uh, there was a stage at which I said to my father, will you send me to university? And he said, I can't afford to send you to university, but I'll prepare you for a life in Africa. And I could never go to university and never did. Um, and I initially started as a, I was a, a political activist, um, particularly in land rights in the mid 80s to late um, 80s and early 90s. Uh, and then I decided that there was no glory in poverty and I moved into the business sector, and I moved to Johannesburg. And, um, and you know, in Msinga they call Johannesburg Wandonga Zyaduma, which means the place where the walls thunder, because it's a scary kind of place um, if you live there. Anyway, I moved here. My first job was a bricklayer, because I wasn't qualified for anything except doi doing probably, and, go and goat herding. And um, I eventually started a business with two comrades of mine, Jablani and Sandile, called Minanawe Marketing, which was the first business in this country to look at the township economy as an opportunity and as an economy. I mean, this was in 1991, 1992. Um, and, uh, and, and so all of the work I'm going to talk to you about is actually not research or any academic stuff. It's based on the work we did at Minanawe, and I ended up writing two books uh, well, I wrote a book, White Born Zulu Bread, about growing up like that, and two gasinomics books about this informal economy. <clears throat> and I believe that we're surrounded by this negative information, the story of unemployment and inequality and, and so on and so forth, all very negative. Most of it is not entirely true of our economy. And the real opportunity for economic change in our society is within this, what I call, gasinomic sector, and I'll point to it just now. Um, but maybe just as an aside, you know, the first, when, when we grew up, my brother and, and my brother's name is Makonya, my brother and I, when we grew up, we always felt incredibly poor because we had, well, we, we were poor, but we'd like, we'd visit white friends in town, they had TVs and toys and stuff, and we didn't. And uh, the first time I realized the huge benefit of growing up like I did was that I was in Johannesburg and I walked into a pick and pay and I brought my purchases and I was busy paying for my groceries. Uh, and I was writing out a check, which shows how old I am. So I was writing out a check, and the lady behind the counter said to the lady who was packing my bags, she said, <laughs> She means, look at this white man, he's got hair like a baboon, talking about my arms, as you can see. So I said nothing, I wrote out the check, and I tore it out, and as I gave it to her, I said, What way in fanny, Bali check? Have you ever seen a baboon writing out a check? With which she screamed, and she said, Sorry, boss. <laughs> I said, no, I sing so in fan, I sing or bass man, you know. I've gone from baboon to bass. Uh, with which this poor lady fled and stood behind this pillar going, sorry, bass. And of course, everyone was laughing about this poor lady. And I thought it was very funny. I was like, come back. Ooh, yeah. 
and she wouldn't, but, um, and everyone was laughing and, and so on. And as I walked out there, I realized the huge value of growing up like that was actually about understanding deeper things about our society. And those were things about understanding culture, understanding lifestyle, understanding behavior, understanding um, things about um, sarcasm and irony and sense of hope and, and dreams and these kind of things. Because this is what shapes our, our society more than just language. Because many people speak many more languages than I speak. So anyway, to talk back about gasonomics, if you take the Gau train to where it ends in downtown Johannesburg, you walk through Park Station and you'll walk into what feels like Lagos. You'll walk into downtown Johannesburg. And there's this gogo over here, I call it gogo delicious. Uh, she sells 3,000 fed koko amaguinia every single day for one rand each. And she sells about 500 rands worth of tea and coffee, cheese slices, and so on. And so she basically makes 3,500 rand a day from selling uh, amaguinia. She's been doing it for 10 years, and her and her husband have been doing this. And yet we walk past her and we kind of go, oh, shame. Uh, and yet she's making more than a thousand rand a day and her and her husband are building a double story house in Meadowlands cash. And what I said to her, I said, you know, I test this whole thing about unemployment and stuff. I said to her, do you have um, a job? And she said, Nya sebenza, nam sebenzi, which is a play on words. We work, but I do not have work. Because we have created a society where if you do not have a pay slip, you're in essence unemployed. And so we don't recognize this kind of, of sector. This, uh, I was asked by, um, I wrote about Gogo Delicious, and I was asked by an Afrikaans TV show, Vince Lane, if I would um, introduce them to a young person selling fair cook. They said they can't believe that this lady sells uh, um, uh, 3,000 fair cook a day, and they said to me, would I introduce them to someone who sells more? And so I said, walk across the street. And they walked across the street to this young lady, and you can find this if you Google Vince Lane and Gasinomics. She came from Limpopo. She couldn't uh, find a job when she moved to Johannesburg, so she started selling amaguinia. She sells 6,000 fed cook every single day. She's 25, she's, um, and she makes about 2,000 rand a day profit on that. She employs five staff. She employs a nanny to look after her kids because she leaves home at 2 in the morning, and, um, and she's selling by 3 a.m. and finished by about 10. And she employs her brother and three other people. So she's employing five people selling from that stand. Yet we walk past there and we don't really appreciate how big those businesses are. This is called a gorda. Many people know it, the hamburger of the townships. Quarter loaf of bread, slap chips, poloni, cheese slice, and so on. Um, as you can see, it's endorsed by the Heart Foundation. Uh, and it's banting friendly. <laughs> Anyway, in 2005, I was asked by Parmalet to launch cheese slices into the townships. And as most of you will know, in that time, most people did not eat cheese slices. In fact, uh, rich black kids were called cheese boys or cheese girls. And um, so anyway, they asked me to launch into lunch boxes. And I said, well, no, township kids don't get lunch boxes. They get ikeri or pocket money. And so I said, let's launch into quarters and fed cook. And today, Pomelet sells 3 billion rands worth of cheese slices a year, going into Gortas and Fedcook in, um, in, in a market that never existed before. And we created a program for Pomelet called Pomelet Puma Pambili, which is Pomelet Puts You Ahead or Makes You Successful, where we invested in a partnership with these Gorda outlets, where the more Pomelet they purchase, they receive loyalty rewards, and they would receive all sorts of items for, um, you know, for the outlets. And we saw these outlets growing at the same time as Parmalet grew. And this is a theme I'll talk to just now. The real opportunities lie in kind of corporate partnerships in this kind of space. Um, <clears throat> so when I first came to, to Gauteng, I was uh, still involved in various political organizations. I took this picture in about 1989 in Dipkloof and Suetu. And as most of you will know, at that time, every single house in the townships was a four-room house like that. In fact, the foundation of apartheid was built on land and housing, and everyone had to live in these houses. Anyway, I won't go into a history lesson uh, here, um, but this is the same street at the top that uh, um, we, um, you know, if you went there today. There's the little four-room house you can see with the white gate. 
And it doesn't matter which township you go to in the country, whether it's Soshangove, whether it's uh, Mlazi, whether it's Kailicha, wherever it might be, you will find the same thing happening. This rapid transformation of housing from, from uh, forum houses and, and this. And what has that been um, done with? No form of formal credit. In fact, I talk about three forms of credit that have transformed the housing environment. The first one is uh, what I call uh, um, brick by brick home loans. Uh, brick by brick home loans means every month you go and you buy a couple of bricks or a bag of cement or whatever, uh, and you store them. And once you're ready, you phone the builder and then say, Sing Lung Ile, they come and then you start building the house. The other one is lay by, and the other one is Amma Society or stock fells. And we should be celebrating this remarkable story of uh, how we have transformed this space through people's own efforts and own pockets. Um, but if the media is to be believed, the vast proportion of households today live like that in informal dwellings uh, in, in, in shacks, as it were. What would you guys say is the percentage of households today who live in informal dwellings versus formal dwellings. We've got 18 million households, 18 and a half million households in South Africa. What percentage would you say live in, in informal dwellings? 55. 55? 70? 50 in informal dwellings. What would you say is the typical size of household? How many people per household? Six, six. six eight, I heard. Cool. So the important thing that we need to recognize is, as I mentioned after my baboon story, the importance of understanding lifestyle and behavior is a fundamentally important one, and the fact that it's changing incredibly rapidly. Showed you the forum home in Dipkloof, and now what it looks like today. The actual numbers, and these are charts, they're very important charts. And only 8% of households today live in informal dwellings or shacks. 90% of households today live in formal dwellings. And on the right hand side, even more importantly, household size. 23, almost 24% of people are one person households. And 18 or 19% of households are two people households. These are not my figures. This is SA General Household Survey, remarkable stats essay. Um, a tool as well as um, census. So in essence, what is happening? We're seeing this dramatic move to formality, not through any form of uh, formal credit. This is people transforming their houses like I showed you in that slide. And even more importantly, people are moving out the communal home into their own homes. Now, these two figures are actually some of the most important things I'll show you today. They represent opportunity and they represent an understanding of the future. If you look at this little chart uh, over here, in 20 years our population grew by 1% and our households by 2.5%. And in the last one or two years our population has grown by 1% and our households by 3%. Three times more households growth than population growth. So average household size, 3.5% of people, and just under 50% of people are small households, one, two, or three people households. Young adults are moving out of the communal home into their own home. Whether it's a back room or whatever it might be, they're moving out the communal home into smaller homes. Growth of formal, smaller households. Now, if you went to Sweden 30 years ago, there was a little company called IKEA. IKEA built a business. In Sweden, an international business using waste wood to make furniture. That furniture was for one or two people households living in small spaces. And they built this international um, incredible business. And our population structure today, our demographic, is no different from Sweden was 30 years ago. And that's a very important thing to think about. People in smaller households, smaller formal households spend more on design and decor, decorating their house, spend more on comfort, a double bed versus a smaller bed, will spend on beauty and personal care and eating out. These things here represent opportunity and I will elaborate on that when we look at it from an informal sector perspective. And the first one is if you look at backroom rental, there's 20 billion rand a year is earned by South African households in Amarum 
or backroom rental, a mix of small and not so small units. 20 billion rand a year is earned by South African households. We have a shortage of, of households, of small households. We do not have a shortage of houses. We have a shortage of micro rental units like this, which would be no different from the same units that would have been in existence in Sweden and, and Norway. This, um, uh, um, so, and this would be a typical um, room. This lady pays 3,000 Rand, and she, there's a shower, a little Wi Fi, tiny little kitchenette. Uh, this guy over here doesn't even have a, a, um, a, a kitchen. At the top in the center, there's a young lady called Dabi Singh. Dabi Singh works for the city of Johannesburg. She was working in her work for the city and recognized how many rooms there were in the shortage of rooms. So she took her house in Protea and Soweto, that's her house there, and behind it she built 14 back rooms. She rents them for between 2,500 and 3,000 Rand per room. She earns around 48,000 Rand a month that goes into her bank account for those um, rooms. Then she decided to buy another house in Pratia down the road. She demolished the house. She built, um, I think, uh, uh, 14 or 15 rooms that she rents out to NASFAS um, student accommodation. Two beds, Wi-Fi, electricity, everything. She rents them out for 4,500 Rand a bed, 9,000 Rand a room. She earns 100,000 Rand a month from that. Okay, so she earns 148,000 Rand going into her bank account every month over and above her salary, and then she went to Pimville, which is near the University of Joburg. She bought a house, she's demolishing it, and she wants to build 31 units she's gonna rent out. She used her own money to buy that. She went to her bank and she said to her bank, I need to borrow one and a half million rand to invest in, um, uh, to, 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 for cash flow to invest into these 31 units. Look how much money's going into my bank account. And they took two weeks, and after two weeks they said to her, uh, sorry, we cannot uh, lend you the money. So she decided to test them. She went off and she asked for finance for a Mercedes worth 1.3 million rand. And 20 minutes later they approved her finance. <laughs> Which tells us how we think about the sector and the struggles that people, even like her, who's receiving the money in her bank account, have in terms of financing this, despite the opportunity. As I said, there's a shortage. The Department of Housing says there's a shortage of 1.8 million micro units like that nationally. Um, so that just tells us something about the story. But let's just look in those houses. So this, is, this transformation is happening, particularly inside and outside these houses. Um, you know, these would be typical kitchens within this space. Who is, you know, people are renovating their kitchens. There's a company called P, uh, PG Bison. Imports and makes high-end kitchen surfaces and cupboard doors and stuff. They said to me, Gigi, you have no idea. We are growing by 30% year on year. It's a listed company. It's the only listed company in the group that's growing. And they say that 80% of their business is going into township areas into transforming kitchens and, and other things in that space. They just said to me, where's the money coming from? And I'll come back to that just now. But one of the things we see is this massive investment in things like ceilings. Now when I said earlier, people are investing in design and decor. Formal houses, once you have a formal house, when you're in a mkuku or a shack or an informal house of some sort, you invest in keeping the rain out and the cold out. Once you're in, an info, in a formal house, you start spending on design, decor, comfort and stuff. And ceilings are a perfect example. And um, these ceilings, you can see, amazing. This one is the big trend at the moment is uh, chrome gutters. Um, what did you guys say is the pattern? It's very small over there on that little gutter. I'll make it bigger for you. What's the pattern on that? Louis Vuitton. <laughs> the lady inside this house said she was unemployed and she got Louis Vuitton gutters. Um, which tells you something. One in ten odd houses have this and in people investing in this kind of thing. And what are the businesses that are supplying these things? I can promise you a gutter manufacturer here in Santon or wherever it might be uh, does not know about anything about the kind of ceilings people want. Yeah. 
or the kind of curtains. This is, I did some work with Pepco. Pepco is Pep Home. And we went around the country, uh, and the older ladies in this room got oh Lisa, but I just want to tell you the story. So this lady we went to visit in Sightsee and Kailicha uh, with the guys from Pep Home. They're understanding what is the decor items people buy. And the guy walked in there and he said, I love your curtains. And the lady said, yeah, it cost me 25,000 Rand. When the society paid out, I went and uh, bought these curtains. He's like, beautiful. He says, I'm from Pep Home. Have you seen our curtains? She said, yes, I have. Who buys that? <laughs> <laughs> Again, what do they know about what people want and what they desire? And isn't this a point of strength and opportunity like IKEA recognizing that in terms of these spaces? But who is leading our economy? We talk about all these captains of industry. The reality is with the gussipreneurs that I'm going to talk about now. And at the bottom left there is Mbali. Bali sells chicken dust. Most of you will know what chicken dust is. She's got about seven outlets in Bekasdal, Motlakeng, and uh, Soweto. And um, she's got these little outlets. And Mbali buys 1,000 chicken a week. She pays 45 rand per chicken. She sells them for 110 rand, including two salads and papo, dombolo, or rice. So she makes a, a, a really good income from this. And I've been doing some uh, profiles on, on Biz News, Alec Hogg's show, Biz News, around gasipreneurs to try and just advocate for these people. And Mbali was in this interview, so I wasn't Abhi Singh, you can find her interview talking about her bank loan. But Mbali says to Alec, Alec, you know, at the end of the week, I have, uh, I have so much cash left over that I belong to three societies. One I put 15,000 uh, a week in, one I put 10,000 a week, one I put 2,500. She says, because I've got cash left over, now I've become a Mashonisa as well. <laughs> Bali has been to every shopping center around her because she wants to be in a shopping center. She has a turnover probably the same as a KFC or Nando's. She has been to every shopping center, Protea Gardens, Dobsonville, Jablani, and so on. They all turn it down because they say there is no way you can afford to have a business in our shopping centers. Tells us how we reflect on those kind of spaces. Which, talking about that fast food sector, there's a massive sector here what I call Gasi course, about 90 billion rand a year across 50,000 outlets. Whether that's Amapleti, Gorda, Zmlekwa, Chicken Dust, um, and, and Shisanyamas, and so on and so on. And a, a, a huge sector. 100% South African owned. We talk a lot about the foreigners in our economy, fast food sector or um, uh, um, prepared food, 100% South African, those 50,000 outlets, high margin, much more higher margin than a Spiza shop, which I'll talk to just now. Why is this growing? Most people do not purchase that because it's cheaper. In fact, there's a lady in Roslyn outside um, <coughs> the BMW factory in Pretoria. She sells 300 Amapleti for 50 Rand each every single day. She's got a very nice Ford Ranger parked behind her little gazebo and caravan. And <clears throat> I said to her, why do people buy from you? Is there not a canteen inside um, the BMW plant? She said, ask them. So I asked them. And they later on took me into the canteen, gleaming German spec canteen. And I said, but why do you buy from this lady? Because there, the food inside was cheaper, actually, than the lady. The first one, they said, her food doesn't sleep there. So actually, people's perception, this food is fresher than the food that is being sold at the ShopRite Deli or at the BMW Canteen. The second one is, they said, Una Sandra. She knows how to make his shab or chicken dust, whatever. Inside, you know, they, they try, they're just experimenting to do it. And so, therefore, people prefer this food. And where do you find this? Everywhere, down the streets, all around us, is this food. Massive, massive sector and represents a huge opportunity. Why it's also growing? Back roomers don't want to cook inside their back room. They'd rather go outside, get the food, and warm it up in a microwave if necessary. And load shedding. Load shedding has just grown this sector dramatically and will continue to grow the sector. So fast food growing as a sector and represents opportunity. And then, of course, every time I say to people, I work in the informal economy or townships, whatever, they say, oh, spaza shops. Drives me crazy. The first thing you guys have to do is understand this economy, and I'll show you more, is about a multi-sectorial economy. 
If you take a mirror to the formal economy, you will see every one of those businesses represented in the informal economy. They just operate slightly differently. So, but let's talk about spouses. Spouses sector is dominated by um, uh, immigrant traders. They're not all illegal, but that's another story. There are about 100,000 um, spaza shops, if you want to call them that, uh, in the country. <clears throat> they turn over about 187 billion rand a year. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but with the arrival of the Somalis and Ethiopians in particular, they have moved out of the spaza sector. The reason the South Africans moved out of spas is they could not compete with ShopRite, YouSave, Pick and Pay, and all of those guys literally in the same township space. These guys developed what I call spazarettes, supermarket type spazas, like this kind of thing. They had things like combos over here. They understood what were the products that people purchased. They understood this is a guy who's come from Somalia. He's crossed the Limpopo River with crocodiles, whatever. He arrives here and he knows more about us, our consumers and stuff than we do and start selling these kind of combos and so on and so forth. And one of the things that they recognize, the biggest pain point that people have is transport. You don't want to carry your 10 kgs of flour and your 10 kgs, 12 and a half kgs of maize, whatever. So they build these combos, they give credit for the social grant and, and gorgos uh, at the um, end of the month and, and so on. Transformation, 187 billion rand, this is not my information, and Nielsen International Group, 23% growth of the informal spaza sector, and they're talking spazarettes, the spazas struggle still versus 14% in the formal sector. The spazarettes are giving ShopRite, Pick and Pay, Spa, You Save a club. And I work with all of those guys at different times. I've said to them, guys, these guys are going to give you a club. It has now come to be. In fact, ShopRite has just invested in ShopRite Cash and Carry, a range of wholesalers. If you can't beat them, compete with them. So why is this important? And if we look here, there's been a notable shift in consumer behavior. More shoppers choosing traditional trade, read Spaza, as their primary shopping um, uh, destination. More shoppers today are buying at a, shop, at a, at a Spaza ret than they're buying at a shop right or pick and pay as their primary shopping destination. And I'll show you some more of that. People are, clo are shopping closer to the home. What can we learn from the spazarettes and create our own successful retail businesses? What can we learn about this? By the way, this sector pays 25 billion rand a year to South African households in rental. Those spazas do not own those properties and they rent them from South Africans. So a store like this pays about 20,000 rand a month. A smaller store like that pays about 7,500 rand a month to the South Africans. So is the opportunity maybe not being in a spaza or spaza rent? Is the opportunity not to set up rental businesses where we're able to rent out uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and benefit from a different type of business? If you look at McDonald's, McDonald's is one of the largest real estate businesses in the world. Takeaway is just a kind of, you know, thank you for, for letting us be here. And many businesses, what you look at on the surface, a retail business or actually a real estate business. And so is there an opportunity there? And people are starting to get back into this. There's a group here in Mufulu and Soweto, Neighborly. They've got a spazarette type outlet. This is uh, Zuzi. Zuzi has a little business in uh, Togoza, Katlehong, called Zuzi's Way and Pay. She's understood Mampara Week. Mampara Week is that week where the, uh, the, the last week of the month where the week is longer than this your week, money. This week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this week. Look what the Somalis do. They have there, those are tomato packets with nappies in, and they put the label of the different nappies. They understand Mampara Week. Zuzi's way and pay, you can buy one tea bag or you can buy way this and that. And Zuzi is now growing this empire of, of uh, Zuzi's way and pay and she wants to do it around the country. Now, I interviewed her as well and please have a look at it. It's a wonderful story. Zuzi, uh, Zuzi realized she was successful. When she went 
to, uh, she went to a maize meal supplier and she went to this Afrikaans guy and said, will you supply me? He said, I can't give you credit, but I will supply you at the same rate as the shopping, uh, the bigger retailers. She says, when she got there in her polo, she sat there and they lasered the polo and the lights were staring <laughs> up like this. And in front of her, she had a shop right big truck and behind her, she had a pick and pay huge truck. And sitting there in a little polo, she said, I'm not there yet, but now I've arrived in this kind of space. And these are the, 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 the ideas and the opportunities we should be celebrating uh, and learning. And how do we learn from the best practice in terms of retail if we do it? Other sector is the hair sector, beauty sector. I've done a lot of work in the hair extension sector, despite my hairstyle. What would you say is the most stolen product in South Africa's ports, according to the insurance industry? Yes. Hair extensions and wigs. The most stolen product. Not food, not blankets. <laughs> the most stolen product. 64% growth of beauty products and personal care. Lashes, nails, uh, hair extensions, and, 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 and so on and so forth. What did I say? Smaller households spend more on themselves. Those figures I showed about formal and smaller households start telling us what people will invest in. This is Belisa over here. Belisa also was on one of my things. She's a 20 year old. She started her hair business when she was 16. She employs eight staff and she's working from that little hair place over there. And Belisa is holding in her hands there an iPhone 14 Max that cost her 28,000 Rand. She paid for it cash. Um, and this beauty sector, whether it's hair extensions or salons and so on, is a sector that's booming. Again, where do the opportunities lie? The opportunities lie where A, no one is going there or where no one's realizing how fast those sectors are growing. And people like Belisa are growing and, and driving that. Um, a completely separate sector is the goat sector. So my brother and his colleagues, Gugu and co, run a goat business in KZ, a yeah, goat business, a goat NGO in, in KZN. Goats bought and slaughtered in South Africa were worth 4.4 billion rand a year. 1% of those 4.4 billion goats, it's almost, it's almost 2.5 million goats. 1% come from commercial farmers. 99% come from people like Madlamini or Mazwane or whoever it might be who are breeding goats um, at home, Ebaleni or whatever it might be. My brother runs a project in KZN. Uh, we have a shortage of goats in South Africa. We import 500 million rands worth of goats a year from Namibia and Botswana. The Saudi Arabian government asked us a few years ago, asked the KZN government to supply them with a million goats a year for Eid. Uh, and uh, the South African government now, do, how many goats do you think they supply the Saudi Arabians? Not one. Because all those goats are sitting in people's yards, and so one of the projects that my brother started is one working with rural women farmers, where in essence, they help them, they, they, they have veterinary, they train them. They, a goat will have two kids a year, sometimes four kids a year. So you can have a goat herd of 10, and within two years, you have 30 to 40 goats. You sell that goat for one and a half to two and a half thousand rand a goat. And so he finds people who are starting to invest now in goats, and they've created markets and stuff. I won't go into detail. I just love this lady here, Mambele. When I learned about the opportunity in goats, I waited until I received my child grant. I did not spend it that month. I bought goats with it. Once I bought these goats, they increased in number. Today I say to people, you see, with my children, I got grant money on their behalf, and I bought goats. She made 50,000 rand last year selling her goats. They're working with 4,000 farmers, and there's still a shortage of goats. Where are the opportunities in that kind of thing? And it's not only in breeding the goats, it's getting the goats from Msinga and Nkandla and Mthabia Lingana and whatever and sending them off to, to sell them in places like. In, in, in Umla, at um, Umlazi, yes, Pingo there, there's a huge shop, uh, like looks like a shopping center, and it says Goat, goat Hyper, the Goat Hyper. Um, 
Then the last one, as we all know about, is Amos Society or, or um, uh, 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 Stockfells. And I think the mistake we often make is we think of Stockfells as a bunch of gawkos buying groceries. The vast proportion of Stockfells today are Amos Society where people are saving. Even the research shows it there, something of like 43% of savings and only 16% of grocery buying Stockfells. The power of Amma Society is in lending as much as they save. These ladies over here uh, are in Peter Maritzburg, just outside Peter Maritzburg in an informal settlement. And um, I went to visit them. They had, uh, they have a book. There's, uh, there's a, there's a, they pay two rand each. There's 18 of them. And in their book, they have 86,000 rand. This was about two years ago when I saw them. And they arrived there with the Edgars Chekas, and uh, they counted out 26,000 rand on the glancy, on the grass mat there. And I was like, but where's the rest of the money? They said, sometimes we don't have one rand. And in fact, the lady there, she's good going in front of that lady. That lady owns a business where she sells Iskreta, the popsicles, frozen popsicles to the school kids. She bought a freezer for four and a half thousand rand. She sold it. Now she wants to start another one at another school. And so she needs another five thousand rand. They're counting the money out there. She borrows and it goes as four and a half naibuya. It'll be five and a half. So the money is set in advance of how much. The power of Stockfels as a lending vehicle, as a financial vehicle, is the huge power in this kind of space. And why do they not, um, why do they not uh, bank that money? It makes no sense. When they leave the area, that's where the crime happens. The cost of transport to deposit your money, all sorts of things, means it will remain informal, but a very powerful tool. So I don't have time to go into it now, but there's a huge number of sectors. Everything from the taxi sector, 50 billion rand a year. Umuti, or traditional herbal medicine, 18 billion rand a year across 150,000 uh, uh, herbal medicine traders. What is the opportunities? I invest in a business called Ispeto Sempilo, which makes traditional herbal medicine in a more modern format. Where are the opportunities that lie in these kind of spaces when we recognize all of these sectors? So, and yeah, what's the sector you can find opportunity in when you start looking at that? And as I said in the beginning, it's not in Spaza shops. Spaza shops is an overtraded, highly competitive space. There's so many other powerful sectors. The, the alcohol sector, taverns, licensed taverns, 44,000 taverns, 110 billion rand a year. Three quarters of a trillion rand is turning over conservatively within this economy, employing people and creating livelihoods. But the formal sector, everyone says, why would people go to a spazare or whatever? There's these beautiful shopping centers, and this is people's experience of the formal sector. We treat people really badly in the formal sector, and so increasingly they move out of there. And again, this represents opportunities. When COVID happened, this is the kind of queues many people will experience, two to four hour queues, and people hate queues. It's almost like black people don't mind queues, they hate queues. And I make this terrible joke, in a world online, South Africa stood in line. And people queue at the, they queue at the shop, right? They queue at the ATM, they queue at the PEP, they queue at the Fushini, they queue at the KFC, and then they queue to get in a taxi again. They hate queues, and this is meaning that shopping centers outside of month end where people draw money are starting to shop away from that sector. What are the opportunities to think, have things like queue for you, shop for you? I got contacted by a young guy in, uh, who'd seen one of my interviews from Elam, in your day and first, whatever, in the um, uh, uh, Limpopo. He said, I've got this business. I charge the Gorgos 25 rand. I take their card and their pin and their shopping list. And I go to the ATM. I stand in the queue with my guys. I get the, um, I draw their money for them. And then I go to the shop right. I buy the things. She's already got the broadsheet. She's made circles on the thing with this one. I want this one's on special. And then uh, he comes back and he gives it to her. And what are the, again, opportunities where the formal sector is treating people badly for us to elevate experiences? What are the trends that are starting to happen? The first trend that's starting to happen is people are moving away from cash. 
There's this growth of what's called cashback. This is a, a little sh um, spaza shop owned by South African in, in Aguamashu. And there's cashback. 50 rand costs you 55 rand to draw money from the till. 100 rand costs you 105 rand. There are companies like Kazang, Shop to Shop, Flash, which have taken their device that used to sell airtime and lotto and electricity and bus tickets and now put the ability to tap your card. Everyone has a card and most people have two to three cards. We have the highest penetration of cards of any developing economy in the world, partly because the social grants are paid out in a MasterCard card. People are now increasingly going to a spazaret or to a hair salon or to a Gassi course outlet. You can see, um, oh, I haven't got the picture here. Uh, I've got a picture of someone in Umblazi who tapped their card um, for uh, five rand amaguinha and two cheese slices for two rand each, paying nine rand by card for, for amaguinha. Um, so these, these companies have added the ability to tap your card on those devices. Kazang at the top there does two billion rand in transactions a month at 70,000 outlets. In 2021, that two billion rand was 0% card. At end of November 2023, they did a billion rand. Almost 50% of their transactions are card. This is an important thing for two reasons. Oh, and then I launch a product called PayShop. PayShop is a cell phone to cell phone, instant payments across different banks for under 3,000 rand. This was launched across the total banking industry, launched it recently. Card acceptance and the ability to pay by phone and move away from cash is going to change the space. The first one is that you are able to now get one of these devices at your shop and accept card payments. Once you start receiving transactions through that device, you can raise finance from the supplier. People like Ikorka and Yoko will lend you money on that. More importantly, crime becomes less of an issue for both the person who, instead of drawing all your money at the ATM at the shopping center, you go there, the reason cashback's so big, people go and draw 200 rand at a time, or even 100 rand at the time for Ikeri or whatever you need cash for. People say, you know, Imala says, Anlenia Ham. The money that's in your hand goes, so now you keep the money in your card and you just draw. It's gonna be a move to this. How can moving from cash help you? The other thing is that malls are seeing less and less people coming to the shopping center to draw money to stand in those queues. So you can allow people to come to your shop to draw the cash from your shop as opposed to going and standing in a two hour queue. That's transformative. This is a young guy in the bottom left called Rafilwe. Rafilwe has a bakery in Soweto in White City and when lockdown happened, he was selling 500 loaves of bread a day. Lockdown happened, he stopped selling bread, and he said to me, Gigi, I moved to uh, e-commerce. He moved to Facebook Lite and e -Pin on WhatsApp. He put all his bread and rolls and whatever on Facebook Lite, which is the same as Facebook, just most phones come preloaded with Facebook Lite, it's a lower res format, and he moved to almost 2,000 loaves of bread a day where people would go into his Facebook page, order like bread or rolls, whatever, send Epin, and he would then send the guys to go and deliver there. Why is this important? E-commerce in Africa, and South Africa even more importantly, is going to be on WhatsApp, Facebook Lite, and Epin, and you will pay by card. The problem with e-commerce is payment. Now suddenly, what's happening? Look at this, this is just some things I found on the internet of, um, of delivery businesses, from Gassi Delivery to Swiper over there, to Delivery Wire Wire, Order Gassi in Cape Town, Leon Kwabe, uh, Yebo Fresh I'm involved in. Most outlets have a Facebook page, and if you are starting a, a business and you don't have a Facebook page, get a Facebook page. The opportunity lies in doing things like delivery. Remember, WhatsApp is the most powerful platform you will ever have because when you have no data, you still have WhatsApp because you buy a bundle at the beginning of the month. You all don't look like, you all look like you've got contracts. For the people without a contract, 
You buy a WhatsApp bundle of 30 or 50 Rand and you have unlimited WhatsApp for the month. So when you've run out of anything else, you use that. WhatsApp is a very powerful platform. Consider how you use it in your business. Uh, you know, I was talking to a Gogo who belongs to a stock fellow. I said, Gogo, how do you communicate with each other? He said, hey, Danam, I use what what? I was, like, <laughs> I was like, what's what what? And she went into her breast and she pulled out this little Chinese smartphone and she opened WhatsApp. And she said, hi, I'm Danam, let what what? Before I used to say, Kijim, I'm Danam, go spell the span, my span bunny, whatever. Now I just go, what what, what what, what what? And they all, oh. <laughs> even the Gogos are moving to WhatsApp. It's a business tool. It's not a social media tool. Facebook Lite used as businesses is a business tool. You must have a Facebook and a WhatsApp strategy uh, in this space. So as I head towards ending now, this is a guy, young guy, I had to put a picture of myself with uh, Rulani over there, he read my books, and he started a business called Gorta King. You can see some of his Gortas. Um, but what has he done? He's taken his business to another level. He hasn't said this is just a quarter outlet. He now has, what do you have to be the best quarter outlet? Come for training. He'll teach you how to do and run a quarter business. He's got a franchise opportunity over here. Now only 200,000 to have a franchise business like that. When we sit there, in these businesses, we think, ah, oh, it's just a quota outlet, or we think it's just a spaza shop, or we think it's just a whatever bakery. We have to change our mindsets. These are businesses. A former Minister of Small Business Development said a while ago, we need more entrepreneurs in the township. And it drives me crazy. We have hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs in the townships. We have to change our mindset. Not only those people change their mindsets, but we should, as, as outsiders of that space, change our mindsets. These are businesses, these are entrepreneurs, and they are no different to the, the businesses that are in the formal sector. And when you see a Rulan, you recognize that kind of thing happening. You know, when I write about these people, or I inter arrange interviews with them, I see myself as, a, as an economic activist these days. Um, it's a lot safer than politics. And um, I, I, I want to expose people into the space. The first thing they say to me is, why do you want to interview me? And I say to them, I think your business is amazing. Then they arrive at a studio with Alec Hogg, and next thing they're on YouTube, and they're getting 20, 30, 40, 50,000 Mbali, I think got 30,000 views of her YouTube interview with Alec Hogg and myself. And she's like, yo, Gigi, you know, now I'm a celebrity. I'm almost like Housewives of Devon. <laughs> what is that saying to you? Why are we not celebrating those people and actually saying, actually, your opportunity is not in the Gorta outlet. It's the Gorta empire. And like uh, 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 Rulan is doing. Or Lebo over here. Lebo has a little business in Everton doing e-coffee. And he's got an online business. It's a beautiful story of how he started this coffee business. And he now has an e-commerce shop and he uses Paxi, the pet parcel delivery service, to deliver the, the, the coffee. But look, Black Coffee, when he arrived and he did his big show the other day in New York, what's um, Lebo do? He markets himself. Congratulations, Black Coffee. He picks up on that. Informal businesses do not market themselves. I come from the marketing industry. The opportunity to market yourself aggressively to your consumer is a massive one. This is Annika's bakery. Look at where she is. I think she's in Winterfeld. Nom Gobelo's delicious treats. She's in this little mkuku. She, her bed is this side. You can't see it. Her husband, her bed. And then she makes these uh, biscuits and she sells them out there. And they're part of a program that I want to just quickly mention and kind of ending. There's Maggie's Bakery. There's Maggie over there. She's got four of Maggie's Bakeries. Um, and um, these are, are all bakeries. There are so many bakeries. I never realized how many bakeries making everything from bread to, to biscuits to, to wedding cakes and stuff like that. We started with Supreme Flour. Uh, Supreme Business Bakers, Siapambili Ne Supreme. And the idea behind that is every one of these bakeries, if they buy Supreme flour, they're on a WhatsApp database. They take a picture of their till slip 
And when they've received 30 points, which is probably 10 or 20 bags, I can't remember, um, they, they go to the wholesaler, they buy the Supreme, they take a photo on WhatsApp, the WhatsApp bot immediately works out how much they've purchased, what date did they purchase it, what size was it, 10 or 12 and a half kg Supreme, allocates them points, and these bakeries now win baking equipment, generators, uh, aprons, free stock, and whatever it might be. And like I mentioned with the Parmalat, the opportunities also lie in what are the opportunities through corporate partnerships. We often make the mistake of saying this baker over here, Maggie, must sell her bread to Woolworths or Pick and Pay. Guys, that never works. Because the power relationship of a supplier to a corporate business never works. Trust me, many of these guys, like Supreme are my client, they pay me a 90 days. I'm perpetually, I should just be have a baseball bat and chase corporate companies, Unilever, whatever, they pay you, for, where you'll never get your money. Just keep your business. But the opportunity lies, I believe, in creating partnerships where we will buy your Supreme, but we want then some sort of loyalty initiative in return. Where now that's a partnership. You need me, I need you, Zandla Zagezana type operations. And that is again where I think the opportunity is. And I believe that the opportunity is also about how do you create associations or groups of these businesses. Maggie's business on her own is one of, she's got four of them in Harankua and, and Soshangobe and whatever. But on her own, she is nothing. But when she is part of a group of 100 or 200 bakeries, when she goes now to Supreme, even if this program wasn't then goes to Supreme, there are 200 of us, this is how much Supreme we purchase. And go to whatever company, this is how much we purchase. They suddenly become someone that people are interested in. Part of our problem, we do not create these associations. If you look at the Somalis, one of the things that they do is they form these associations and are able to go and negotiate and, and so on. And we should have those associations not as small businesses. That will never work. As bakers, or gassy mechanics, or hair salon owners, or uh, um, you know, gorda outlets, or whatever it might be, we need to look at these as different sectors. So in ending, they say, Ingwe ilda ngamabala. Ingwe ilda ngamabala means a leopard eats using its spots. It understands the environment within which it operates. It understands the camouflage it needs. It understands what his prey uses. Look in the mirror, don't look out the window. We spend too much time looking out the window, the opportunities, the mirror around our rural areas, our townships. Look in the mirror, that's where the first opportunity lies. Other opportunities are represented in culture, lifestyle. What are people's pain points? A pain point will be standing in a queue. Uh, a pain point will be the cost of transport to carry all my possessions home. Uh, understanding households. What do smaller households want? What do bigger households want? There's still many big households. What do they need? Let's understand opportunities represented by these things. Embrace technology, but the technology you embrace is not the technology you're thinking. It's WhatsApp, it's Facebook, it's uh, payments like tapping your card on a little device in a spaza shop, uh, Facebook Lite and, and, and so on. I talk about gorillas, not gorillas. So the, the, the military one, not the one that's in the forest. Small is the new big, worldwide. Small is the new big. And in the, you in the community, you mobile, you can adapt. Look at how um, uh, Rafilwe went from the bakery where he was delivering and stuff to suddenly he was on EP and WhatsApp and, 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 and doing that kind of thing. Move fast. Big companies cannot move fast. It doesn't matter which one it is. They cannot move fast. ShopRite knows. I know because I work with ShopRite. Capitech know that the queues are a major issue and it's a reason shoppers are very upset with them. But how quickly can they stop queues? They can't. But the Spaza shop suddenly has the tap and do cash back. Suddenly they're under threat. Scale up, not start up. Scale up means take your business from a small business to a big business. Don't try and start a new business. These exist in the community. They're all there. How do we take them from a little one and make them bigger and bigger and bigger? A bit like Rulani is doing. Form associations and force companies to engage with that association. You can knock on that door as long as you like. You won't get there alone. 
form these associations by different sector. And really in ending, this informal world is inhabited by tribes of survivors, of gasipreneurs, of tabletop traders, hawkers and hustlers, gasikos, restauranteurs, spazaret superstores, and backroom rental barons. Go among them, give them respect, for you are the future, a gasinomic power. Thank you. I can't tell you how privileged I am uh, or I feel certainly to have been sitting through your presentation this morning. Thank you. I think so many of us grow up in the townships, but I think we aspire to leave completely oblivious to the opportunities that are there. I mean, as you are speaking, I'm thinking about you know the amount of bed, uh, bedrooms that I could build in my mother's backyard. <laughs> I'm thinking about the stock felt that we have as the ladies at the Tabo Baby Foundation and how we can make it better. I'm thinking about the frustration I had the last time I was home wanting to do my nails and there was just no nail parlor nearby. So those are really the opportunities that are available. But I think let me open the floor um, for some engagement. I think back to Mrs. Mbege's point, perhaps in the interest of time, let's do about 10 minutes of Q&A with Gigi so that on the day we don't have too long a video that we are projecting in our community. So I'm going to open the floor, please, and engage Gigi. Maybe let's start with three questions. And then we'll see how, how we go for, for the rest of the morning. Yes, please. Sir. You mentioned um, uh, the money. Where does the money come from for, for people to start their businesses? So, so there's probably come kind of two or three different ways. Um, and when you look at it all, the first one is that, um, so, so um, I just want to go back to the Somalis. One of the things the Somalis do is they mobilize money outside of the family. So they will get a group of them together and they'll put money together. Uh, and they are Muslims, so they do, don't do interest. They basically buy shares in a spaza shop. And then once the spaza shop does well, they buy that person out and they invest in another one and so on. South Africans do it within the family. And I think that's a mistake already. And then you employ family members to work in your spaza shop and then... And, and that's where the problem is. So, so what we see is that, so, so obviously society is a massive, a massive one where people wait for the uh, Stockfell of society to pay out. The other way most people start a business is um, they'll be working at a Gorda outlet and then they'll want to go and start and the owner will help them start up somewhere else. Um, so you'll see them Bali. She has someone who works with her, manages one in Beckersdale, and then she says, okay, now you take over this business, and then that person does it. And you'll be surprised how much of that is there, of people starting a business, they worked with someone, and then they went and started their own business. Um, the third way is generally, and this is where most businesses don't survive, is it's incremental. So I, when I started my business, Minanawe, I met someone who changed my thinking about business who said, how are you doing? I just started with Jabs and Sandile and we had nothing. We were just knocking on doors asking for marketing business. And um, this guy said, how are you doing? I was like, no, we're doing all right. We're getting business. And he said, just remember this. Turnover is, um, turnover is vanity. Profit is... Um, Profit is sanity and cash flow is reality. This is what kills businesses, cash flow. They do not receive financing and it's not financing to buy an oven. It's not financing to buy, build a shop. It's finance to get stock, hold that stock until you've sold, buy new stock, pay for that and so on. And this is one of the biggest things. People buy two apples, Bali, she started with one chicken. She used to work at Woolworths in Cedar Square as a cleaner at night. And she went and started, a, um, she went and started, she bought one chicken and sold one chicken. She then bought two chickens, she sold two chickens and she kept on se selling her chickens like that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and, and so that's how, you know, the, the businesses, the biggest problem is this incremental growth of businesses. And this is why businesses often fail. Because they have something, a child gets sick, I have to take the money out of the business and take the child or buy a muti or something, or there's a msebenzi and I have to help the family, whatever. And that's where these businesses and the ability to have that. So, but that's how a lot of them start. One chicken, two, three, eventually a thousand. 
but in that process, many don't survive. <laughs> yeah. So, so people ask me a lot about tax, and I mean I could go on and detail about it. So the first thing is that in Rwanda it takes you four days to register a business. In South Africa it takes you forty. So try and register for CIPC on your own. You need a utility bill, you need a proof of residence and so on. Most people pay as you go electricity. Do you have a title deed or proof of where you live? And, and, and. Forget before you've gone onto that system and tried to register your business. So people aren't registered because they don't want to. Most of the time, they, they're not, um, you know, it's just too much of a hassle and there's no benefit to it. The second thing is that VAT um, registration and submission is a nightmare. I sold my business Minanawe and I started under Gasinomics and I was used to having a board of directors and stuff and when I started Gasinomics as a business I wanted to register for VAT. Eventually I got a bookkeeper to help me paying the bookkeeper to do it and then SARS said to the bookkeeper he has to come for an interview. I went for a four hour interview Oh, sorry, I sat for four hours before I got a five-minute interview at SARS and Randburg, sitting on the silver steel table, uh, benches there with my bookkeeper next to me. How many quarter outlets or hair salons could go and, and do that? And then eventually the guy, I spoke to him for five minutes, he's like, okay, you can have a VAT number. I've been sitting for four hours. It just drove me crazy. Now, how many people can do that? Having said that, so we create barriers, and I've said this to people like Reserve Bank and others, we create barriers towards including people in our economy, even from CIPC and stuff like that, which other countries do not do. These businesses pay VAT, but do not claim VAT. There's a 15% net benefit to the, um, to, to the economy of them not claiming VAT, whereas most corporate businesses claim VAT. They create a massive demand. Supreme Flower or Unilever or Tiger Brands or Capitec are selling more and more every year. Look at ShopRite's latest business. There's no way in an economy with unemployment like it is that they would be doing that turnover without this space, these incomes. And those companies make huge profits from this space. And I assume they're paying their full tax on their profits. So just the profits being generated by companies who engage in the sector just offsets whatever individual profit people will be, uh, tax people will be making. But here's for me the biggest thing. If we did not have this economy, if we did not have the incomes generated by this gasonomic economy, we would have riots in this space. We had have starvation in this place. We would have Koshyoko, we'd have whatever it might be. If it was true that one in two people are unemployed, there's no way that this is just social grants. If we didn't have that space, this country would be in a mess. We should be celebrating and thanking that sector for creating social stability, for spending money on Louis Vuitton gutters and Brazilians and buying orders and stuff because actually, uh, that economy is actually sustaining social stability and economic stability in our country. So yes, should they pay tax? Should they be involved in the system? Yes, make it easier for them to get involved in the system. But at the same time, we should recognize the incredible economic contribution that this sector is making to, 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 uh, to our, our economy. Uh, good morning everyone, my name is Ntanga from uh, WDB. Uh, I don't know if churches, these small churches are a topic for another day. Where does it uh, benefit us on this Gasinomics? Because we are having so many ch small churches in Gasi. Uh, how are they providing in our economy? Or are we benefiting or are they benefiting from our economy? So I've worked I've worked with the Shambe Church, in fact walked up the mountain with them in KZN. Uh, um, I can in fact I wrote a chapter in my book about the churches. Um, but um, 
Uh, look, I think that first of all, if you look at the churches, the vast proportion of people belonging to Amma Society or Masnuabisane and other um, savings entities belong to churches or do it within the church. So there's clearly something there. Um, and, um, you know, so from a, but from an economic business perspective, I can't comment about their incomes, but I, I do know that the vast proportion, and, and I think that one of the mistakes we make is with, when we look at our society, we underestimate the level of spirituality uh, and, and the role that those churches play within the communities. Because we hear the stories of negative stuff. We don't hear the stories of stability. I mean, I see now, you know, in many, most of the townships, you have the CPF, you know, these gorkos and these uh, old men with vuvuzelas and a torch walking around and, and looking after the street. And we don't talk about that. Oh, crime's big. But we don't say, look at how people are responding to these things in positive, strong, community-led ways. And, and it's, isn't that the thing we should also do when we celebrate this? Let's celebrate the roles. I mean, I've got some beautiful photos. I was doing some stuff with Supreme Bakers in Soweto the other day. And there was this gogo with a bib and a torch because it was dark when we went to the bakery. And a vuvuzela. I was like, hey, Gogo, can you blow that vuvuzela? She's like, hey, it's like I'm at Kaiser Chiefs when there's tango nutsots in Jengishaya. <laughs> Why don't we celebrate those things? I'm Evans, Mark Edward from the Development of Microfinance, Development of Microfinance Association. Um, I think this was a brilliant presentation. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, but I couldn't help but wonder how the laws, the bylaws, municipal bylaws, all sorts of laws in this country, yeah. how they impact on the AKC entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. So I've, I've written about that and spoken about that in detail. It does dampen it down, and, and it goes as far as how you register for your business. We do not have development finance in South Africa. Outside of South Africa, we have massive development finance, which is, in essence, business finance. We have no forms of short-term uh, trade finance, as I mentioned, in terms of buying something and paying for it and stuff like that. And we aren't legislated for it. Um, the other thing about it is that I, I was at a talk of the Microfinance Association and I mentioned the backroom sector and I said, you know, maybe we should look at affordability based on rental. And I said, for instance, if this lady is renting out so many, she gets a lease, she goes to CNA, she gets a lease agreement and then she, she um, uh, submits it and then she gets money, she can build another back room and, and stuff like that. And, we, and I could see the guys were interested, they could, you know, the Mashonisas could lend out more money. I got off the stage and a very grumpy Afrikaans lady from the uh, microfinance authority, whatever, got on the stage and she said, don't even think about it. Don't even think of using informal incomes as any form of affordability or, or, or proof that you could, that they're running a business. And I went to her afterwards, I said, why not? She said, because they're informal. Mm -hmm. That is a major issue. It's like her and Dabi Singh's issue. So, so we have the wrong legislations. Um, and, and the problem is legislation, even if it's been done the right way, was in essence 100 years old. Municipal bylaws were built in London in the Victorian era, and we've translated them here. We see the problems with the solar industry. We see the problems with Uber. We see the problems with Airbnb. The current legislation in the formal sector isn't keeping up. It's even worse in our environment. And uh, I advocate for us to look at those, relaxing them. And it seems crazy that you can borrow money from a microfinance person of, at 5% at, uh, at a month, 5% a month or 3% a month, which is the official rate for the second loan of the, of, the, of the year. But you cannot go and borrow, and you can take that money and I don't know, I, you know what do people use it for? They pay for msebenzi or funeral or they, they uh, pay, buy something. But you cannot borrow money to put into your business. It is insane. That is the law. You cannot borrow money for your business, but you can borrow microcredit, unsecured microcredit. And, and I think that that's insane. I've been engaging with some of the banks, and I think increasingly there are people looking at that space. But it, legislation is, is an issue, and we need levels of legislation. Microfinance for businesses, are, development finance is huge in East Africa, West Africa, and so on. Sorry, Cecil. 
can get the volume up. Okay, it's Lomundu Mabongo. And my question is, um, in terms of these informal businesses, what is growth for them? Because you say small is the new thing, but ideally they want to grow. Yeah. So what is growth to them? So the remarkable thing I've found is that if you ask any of these businesses, they all want to grow their business. And um, the, the, you know, they want to start another business, they want to s sell more. Generally, they want to start another one, another one, another one. Um, like Maggie, she's got four of her bakeries or three or four. And, and, and uh, that is what they want to do. Even if they haven't done it, they want to do it. Or like Mbali wants to move off the street and she wants to have her Mbali's chicken dust in the shopping center. So, and that is a wonderful thing. Is that not an amazing thing that these people want to transform their business? They're not just happy there is that I buy this, I sell this in Fayeko Queenie and then I chill. They're wanting to grow their businesses. And so the, the issue is that they are severely limited in the ability to grow those businesses. The aspiration, the desire, the ambition is there. It boggles my mind. Every t and I tell you what, when you ask them, they say, you see what I'm planning. And over there, they've started buying like some ovens or they, you know, whatever it might be, they're preparing something for the next level that they're going to go to. We are restricting that space by not supporting them to do that growth. And, um, and, and what we do, if you listen to any of these incubators, if you listen to the government uh, departments, they talk about we need to start new businesses. No, we do not want to start new businesses. We need to take the existing businesses and make, help them grow. And the mistake we make is the assumption that we can start a new business. Guys, any one of those people out there, ask them how hard it was to start. It's not for sissies. Starting a new business, most businesses do not survive two years startup businesses. Go and find every business that has survived for two years and you will find a sustainable business that is then ready to be grown. But if I listen, we're going to create entrepreneurs, we're going to create jobs, we're going to st start new businesses. Wrong language. We're going to help the entrepreneurs who are already there to grow their businesses. That's a different language. To find out the lady with the NASA's rooms was going to the bank and the, where she banks her money and they refused her a loan and she went for the Mercedes Benz and bought it in, in, in four hours. So what what did this lady do? Where would she what would she do? So interestingly she didn't buy the Mercedes, she was testing her bank. She turned it down because she said to me, she said, Gigi, one appreciates and one depreciates. I don't want to depreciate it. I then did that thing, and this talks to what I said earlier about celebrating and, and, and publicizing this. When we did the thing with Ndabi Singh on Alec Hogg's Biz News show, <laughs> she said to me, people were contacting me, that contacting Alec, and I said to her, okay, do you give me permission to pass people? She must have had 50 financial institutions shopping center owners and others contacting her through us to say, we will lend you the money. Don't even worry about it. She was picking and choosing. I had a guy from Australia who was an ex-South African who said, I've got an investment business. I will lend you a lot more than that kind of money. And, uh, and she engaged with them. I'm not a, I know she engaged with, with some of the people. But, but the point is, is that how many Dabi Sings are there who don't get that exposure? Um, and um, I mean, I'm doing this once a month. Every time I do them with Alec Hogg's show, I, um, I, I, I can't believe how many people want to, people first of all feel better, but also they just say, how can we start engaging? And going to my one slide where I said, let's engage with corporate relationships and stuff. If we did a better job, at publicizing, exposing, even if we created a portal where this was more public. Let's not tell the negative stories. Those are important. I, you know, if you Daily Maverick do those things or the Daily Sun, but there's stories that are not being told. And when we tell them, we find interest in people associating or connecting or whatever. My biggest problem is I get contacted by corporates all the time. Can you connect us with all these uh, people out there? And I can't. I meet them through what I'm doing. It's not my day job. And so 
but we'll imagine if we could create the exposure to them. Um, and, and I think that one of the things that we have when we create these portals or hubs or whatever, we don't create something. So, you know, there's this um, the one uh, in Gauteng government has one, whatever. It's for people looking for a job. It's not profiling a business and what are the opportunities for them. So almost you need a shark's tank at a huge, huge hundreds of thousands of people kind of thing. Tell the stories. Tell them in exciting ways. Tell the stories that people go in like, this is, I love the story. It makes me feel better. I want to see how I can and build around that. And, and I, I mean, I, I'm doing this purely because I, I, I have a lot of passion. I believe in it. But I cannot believe by telling these stories how much interest people, and we should just tell more of these stories. And we need to also tell them from both sides. The people in the townships go like, yeah, I'm like in Dabi Singh. I'm also like a business. I'm an entrepreneur and are proud of themselves and feel better about themselves. They don't, they're lonely out there. You know, they're not seeing how they, Elon Musk's an entrepreneur, not me in Dabi Singh. Now they suddenly say, yo, I'm like on YouTube and whatever. That's a one side. And the other side is the people who can look at them with resources, say, I want to engage in that kind of space. And there's a real job to be done about celebrating these people in this space. Thank you so, so much, Gigi. Thank I you. think this, for, I, I think I speak for all of us when I say this was absolutely, absolutely education. Mm -hmm. Such rich insight. Mm -hmm. Thank you for making the time. And thank, thank you, you to Mrs. Mbeki for tracking you down <laughs> and bringing you to us. Where do we find you on social media? Can we share your email address? How do we reach you? So um, I'm very active on, uh, I've got a, a Facebook page, like I should have, um, and uh, LinkedIn. And I, um, and you'll find a lot of my stuff on YouTube if you Google it. Um, my email address on my website at gasinomics.co.za. Um, and on all the platforms, you are Gigi Alcock. Gigi Alcock or Gasinomics. You'll Gassi interchangeably Gassi. find both of those. Um, and I post a lot of this all the time on LinkedIn and, and Facebook uh, business page and so on. So. Um, worth following there. Wonderful. Gigi, we'll be sticking around. There are some nibbles outside for us to enjoy. Um, oh, and can we please have a good photo when we're done? Please stick around for pictures after, for pictures and to engage Gigi some more. Unfortunately, we had to cut a little bit short for the purposes of projecting on the day. Um, we are at the end of today's proceedings, but before we close, I would like to call upon TMF, Tawabege Foundation's Chief Operating Officer, Lukanyo Nier, who's going to do the vote of thanks and then close. After Lukanyo, I won't come back. We'll just go to our group photo. Uh, Victor, you'll direct us right here. We'll do it right here, and then we'll have some nibbles outside. Thank you so, so much for making the time to be with us today. I, I must confess, I don't know why Anga invited me. She's already done the thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Uncle Gigi. She's already thanked you all for coming today. But Patricia, I wanted to say, Gigi, um, you, you won't know this, but in 2022, we had a, an IWD event with Muhammad Yunus. He dialed in from Bangladesh. Uh, the technology wasn't great that day. But uh, if, if we were to play his one alongside what you just done today, you really just done an extension of, of, of that uh, 2022 of ours. And I'm certain that the people who will listen and watch this uh, on the 9th of, 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 Mar of March will really find it enriching. Part of the, the things we've grappled with as both as the organizers of, of this event is how does it become practical? Mm -hmm. How does it become actionable when people leave the room? And I think the, what you've done wonderfully today has been to give uh, not just insights for the sake of insights, but ways of people, ways that people are able to engage with it in, in tangible ways. The second thing that I wanted to say uh, before I, I, I do an actual thank you um, is that um, uh, one of the things that become quite interesting about the way you've done this as well, in many of the sectors we were talking about, there are sectors that are predominantly driven by women. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things we, we've done um, um, well in a bad way is to invisibilize the actions of women. Yeah. Um, and, and, and there are questions that we need to be asking off the back of, of, of this talk of yours, is who benefits when we do that? Mm -hmm. uh, who benefits when, when we do celebrate women? Mm -hmm. uh, and why don't we celebrate women when they do these things? 
and why do we choose not? Why we choose, why can we choose to? And I think that it's a very powerful thing that you've done in just in some of the examples we have looked at today. The the last thing I wanted to do was 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 to thank you, Gigi, uh, uh, not for you speaking today, but for causing us to come together even in such a small setting. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the. Uh, the key lesson for ourselves as WDB, as the Tower Media Foundation, and other organizations is that we should potentially come together more often uh, uh, and, and do small uh, discussions of this nature. Uh, and so the first thank you was to thank you for making us come together. Uh, forget that you came, forget that you spoke, but you caused us to, to come together. So thank you for that part. But also thank you for all the different colleagues who have come together from the whole range of different organizations and associations. You've taken your time from uh, um, uh, um, doing productive work uh, and causing the, the economy to grow, but uh, you've come to do it uh, to learn and engage and to make, uh, I must think, uh, make us think differently about uh, the country. And then lastly, to thank you yet again, Gigi. Uh, the, I'll tell you a quick story. Mrs. Mbeki had a, a quick discussion with the CEO of the foundation who then calls me afterwards and says, Mrs. Mbeki uh, has, has heard about Gigi, she's watched Gigi, uh, can you get his number, can you, can you get him? So I then begin a whole range of calls to people. <laughs> uh, so I said, Fred, do you know Gigi? No, I don't know Fred, I don't know Gigi. But I know someone who knows uh, Gigi, uh, from, uh, Mark Forrest, uh, so Mark is basically calls, I uh, send the, the details. So we, we, I called Gigi a few minutes, he says, sure. And uh, we agreed that he'd come see us in a few days. And he came promptly and agreed to see us. And that's how we, we, we made a chat today. So Gigi, you've been wonderful in the uh, two, three weeks we've known you. Uh, you. So we, we really appreciate it. And we hope that we'll continue to engage with you and continue to work with you, uh, both from this IWD event and beyond that. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.